one of the things I was thinking about was the last time that you and I recorded together was when we were recording the teaser for the very first op- episode of Operations. Wow. And you probably don't remember this, but it like has been embedded in my brain. Basically, I like had this whole thing ready to go where I was like, yeah, Dave, like, you know, operations people are really bad at like telling their own stories and we don't have a good brand. And so like, that's what this show is going to be all about. And you were like, nah, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Hey everyone, welcome to Operations, the show where we look under the hood of companies in hypergrowth. My name is Sean Lane. Have you ever heard the people team or the recruiting team at your company talk about having a boomerang employee? Someone who left and then later comes back to rejoin the company later? We've had a few awesome boomerang stories during my time at Drift, but we just recently announced arguably our most significant boomerang yet. In 2015, Drift hired its first marketer in Dave Gearhart. During his four years at the company, Dave, or DG, grew to become the company's VP of marketing and helped create one of the most well-known brands in our industry along the way. After spending the last two years as CMO of Privy, which was recently acquired, Dave returned to Drift as our new chief brand officer. That's a pretty good boomerang story, and so as you might have guessed, Dave is our guest on this week's episode of Operations. Now, rather than talk about Dave's return, I actually wanted to talk about what he learned during his time away from Drift. In our conversation today, we talk about how his views have evolved on marketing ops and ops in general, how he thinks about measuring the unmeasurable in brand marketing, and if you stick around all the way to the end, you'll get to hear which marketing metrics book is currently sitting on DG's bookshelf. But to start, let's talk about how Dave's experiences led him to this shift in thinking on building teams and specifically on marketing operations itself. I found a tweet of his where he described that ops would now be on the top of his hiring list when he started a new team, when just a few years ago, it wouldn't have been. So what happened along the way to cause the change? I was doing marketing at Drift and then I left and I took a CMO job at this company called Privy. Um, Privy is uh, a, an app in the Shopify ecosystem. They just got acquired by a company called Attentive in June. And um, they have like 500,000 people using the product. It's, it's, they, they have a great, a great business. When, when I took this, so, so a couple things actually. Well, so number one is I, as I'm getting older every year, I'm learning that it's okay to change your mind on things. And in fact, you'd be an idiot if you didn't. Like, I want to be, I should be the better version, like us talking two years later, I should be the better version of, of, of Dave than I was two years ago, period, and, in, in all aspects of life. That's kind of like my, my mindset. Um, and and so, so with that, like, obviously, my views on, on marketing and doing my job and being a marketing leader or, or doing marketing all have also completely changed because not only have two years gone by, but I now have – I have more context. And so, like, before Drift, really, I just was kind of – I was a very junior-level marketing person, a cog in the wheel at other places. Drift is where I got to really own stuff. And then I went to Privy, and at Privy, I we, we we rebuilt the marketing team. We kind of reassessed everything, and so there was seventy people at the company, but we kind of restarted in marketing. And so I built out the team from from basically zero to seven people, and had to come in as the like as the CMO. My first job, my first like six months there was really figuring out the systems and figuring out the teams and figuring out where this data is and where this. Uh, and so, so I have more context now and that I've, now and I've kind of done it twice. And the thing that hurt me, uh, as a, as a marketer and marketing leader is in, in both cases is just transparency and, and cleanliness of data because, mm. The, I, I love marketing. I think that I'm good at marketing. I love the creative and storytelling part of it. But like, it's so much hard. Like marketing is actually not that hard if you have good data because all you're kind of doing is like trying to go do more of what's working, finding more pockets of what's working, testing them. But that stuff becomes increasingly challenging if you can't like articulate wh- what's working. If you go and spend a ton of time on something that like – isn't driving revenue. Like everyone's always busy. Everyone's doing stuff, but we're not driving revenue. And so like 
what I learned is at Drift, we did it a little bit later and that's fine. Like we went through, we went through hyper growth at that company. Yep. You know, I remember when you joined, it was like, you were like, oh my God, this is a disaster. <laughs> and that's like every fast growing startup is, is going to, is going to be that. Of course. Uh, and I think also like, I was also just a little bit more biased towards the other stuff at the time where I was like, Let, let's, let's just keep going, doing more faster. More people are showing up at our store. Let's not worry so much about where they came from. And, and as opposed to like the fact that they're here. And I think what I learned through that experience in Privy is that it just makes my job as the marketing leader so much harder <laughs> from, uh, yeah. hi hiring, budget, planning, forecasting, modeling, like all that stuff is is predicated on having good data and if you have if you have good good data good analytics strong operational foundation then it is then it is easy to you know rel relatively speaking it is easy to forecast it is easy you're you're making more educated guesses and so i think uh that plus just like i did this podcast and i talked to a lot of cmos who are much smarter than i am and uh bill masitis who was a cmo of slack and zendesk and uh, was a, a high exec at, at Salesforce, he's like, the first thing I do anywhere is hire ops and analytics, build that foundation first, and then build from there. I think the combination of all those things is why I've, I've changed my opinion on that. Well, I think too, all of the outputs that you described, right, making it easy to forecast, making it easier to make those decisions, all the inputs that you mentioned about having the good data, setting up those foundations, like that's the stuff that actually takes the time and investment, right? Where it doesn't feel like it's actually moving the needle when you're first starting, but then over right. time, I think that you get you get more of a yield out of it. When you're having those conversations with those leaders and, and now that you have kind of reframed your thinking on this a little bit, for people who are listening who want to work with leaders like you and want to be good partners for, for folks like that, like, what do you look for now? If, if you were going yeah. back and, and maybe starting at the privy role again, or, or you know, being a, a marketing leader again, what are you looking for in those in those foundational marketing ops folks? Well, so I think I think there's kind of like I think there's I think there's probably two buckets of marketing ops people. This is at least in okay. my head. This is not right or wrong. This is just like what I what I think it could be. And so I think you have the let's let's assume they're both good. We're not talking about like people who are not good at their job in some capacity, right? These are good good marketing ops people, right? There's two camps. One of them is like they're just the systems systems Sean. He, you know, is going to set up Drift and Salesforce and Google Analytics and you and he's going to do lead scoring and routing and he's the plumber. That role is hugely hugely valuable. Huge like that that is that is the role. But I think like the the real like the 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 role that I would like overpay for in hiring, for example, or like if this was a free agent, like I would I would I would overspend on you as a big free agent, is if it's someone who can also be in my ear about what to do with marketing because of those things. And so it's like, hey, you know, this this channel has slowed down or it's looking like it's slowing down. And there's almost even levels of that, by the way. There's like, there's the there's like the person who can call those things out. That's great. Mm -hmm. The even better version is like can call those things out and help you start to push you in directions of like what to go and do. And like, you know, this is something that you've done. Like, you know, I, I haven't worked with you in a while, but like you're you're probably the better version of of yourself. But like, you know, you you were good at like here's the like yes, we're gonna get all the data wired together in the right way, but like here's some things that I think we should go do with it for what about this channel? What about hiring? And so I think, uh, the, the more that the marketing ops person can, can also understand that strategy. And, um, uh, I, I kind of had, I have a relationship with, with a, with a really good marketing ops person. And he, we, we kind of had, we we're doing some calls over a couple months, just like for, from a coaching perspective, he wanted to get into a marketing leadership role. And he felt mm -hmm. like it was really hard to get into a marketing leadership role into, uh, into marketing ops. And I said, well, if you actually can own that, that strategy piece, the strategic stuff that I talked about, that would actually be the dream scenario to, to run marketing is because you're influencing that. So I don't think you can do it if you only are the tactician and only stitch together the systems. 
But if you can stitch together the systems and understand what the business needs and how marketing or whatever ops, whether this is sales ops, CS ops, whatever, how your business unit you know, needs to operate, that, that's like the, that's the holy grail. It's so interesting how Dave's views on marketing ops and ops in general have evolved. First, he recognized that the value of data and systems and analytics as a marketing leader are important to him and the pain that it was presented to him when he didn't have those things in place. But what I think is even more helpful here is the way he breaks down the different types of marketing ops people that he's worked with. First, what he calls System Sean, connecting the plumbing, the tools, the underlying data. Then there's this second category, and Dave didn't give this one a name, so I'm gonna call him Strategy Sean. And this is what the hyper gross leaders are looking for. If your team is big enough, you might be able to have folks on your team that can focus on each of these categories separately. But chances are, when you're starting a new team from scratch, you're gonna need people who can do both the systems and the strategy side of things. Now, it's not easy to do both, but that's the type of partner that DG and leaders like him are looking for. In the strategy bucket of work, when DG talks about having someone in his ear, it underscored for me the importance of understanding how the leaders you work with like to communicate. So how should operators communicate with our marketing counterparts? I think it's different. I think everybody is different. Like mm -hmm. there are people like, so, so Mike Volpe, who was the CMO at HubSpot, he's the CEO of Lola. He's, he's my like, been my CMO mentor coach since the early days. He's someone who would, prefer you don't send him an email he you know well maybe not so much now but like in his day he would want the like send me the excel file right or, or send me the send me the the whatever and and i think that's his mode of operating i'm i i am not like i didn't write there, there's i think there's different paths to i would say it starts with understanding like what is the path that that marketing leader took? And so like, if this yeah. is, if the, if the marketing leader, like the, the CMO of LinkedIn, for example, she came up through PR and comms, right. Or like, or like myself, I, I think that I, I, I am more of a comms brand product marketing kind of that that's my thing. Like I'm more of a storyteller. Uh, I do love the channels and all that stuff, but, but I'm not going to be the one that you're going to send the Excel file to. I'm going to slice and dice it and check your work. Like I'm going to hire you because I, you're way better than that than me. And so, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, a guy that I worked with at, at Privy, Ryan Pinkham, he's now like SVP of revenue. I think he's he, amazing. Uh, and he, he was like his, his whole thing. Like a lot of these made up examples I use, I'm referencing him secretly is like, he would say, here are three trends that I'm seeing. And here are three different approaches for each. That, and so like, he was really good at like taking time out and like sending me a long email or deck or video that's like, hey Dave, three things on my mind. Like we've been, you know, as you like, as we've been talking about, revenue is a little bit slow right now. I kind of had some time over the last week, and I got three things on my mind that I want to talk through. Right? And I love that format. Like I think so often we get caught up in like what's the perfect way to deliver that. We're like, you're an expert. You're you're on this team. Like you know this better than I do. I want you to come to me and say like, there's some things that I found. I, like it, it makes me sleep at night. It makes me sleep so good at night. It made me sleep so good at night knowing that someone as smart as that guy was thinking about what could be broken and what's happening. And so I love this like, and I've seen CEOs do this well, well like on company wikis and stuff, just like, you know, three things on my mind. And I've also felt, mm -hmm. I've also seen this as, this is a great way for people listening to like begin to own your career a little bit more is like when you kind of do your work in public, like early days for me adrift on the wiki as just like a marketing manager, I would be like, here's three SEO things that I think we should be doing. I don't know SEO that well, but like, here's some things, here's two things on my mind, like be sharing that and you will bring other people in with you. And so Ryan would do a great job of that, but he wouldn't just flag problems, right? Because you know, if, you, right. if you're a manager, your, your whole day is problem solving. I, I don't need people to flag more problems. I need people to um, point us in the right direction for solutions that I can helpfully help, help us solve as a, as a team, whether that's with people, budget, whatever. 
and, and so he would say, here's three, here's three things that, are, that, are, that might be broken, and here's different options. Here's the no-budget option. Here's the no-time option. Here's the longer-time option. That, then I now have like a readout that I can digest on my own, give my own opinions, and then we'll sit down together, and like I, I, might, I might be able to read that email and make a decision, or I might want to break out more and spend more time on it. Like, I, just, I love that, that as a template that anybody can steal in, in any role, really. Yeah, I really like the idea of understanding the path that the leader went through to get to the role that they have today, because it, it's going to give you, I think, a re- some really good clues on on how they might view a particular problem or the lens they might view a particular problem. And it's one thing to like identify that, but you can also hopefully help them to fill in the blind spots that they might not be as well versed in as well, right? Because that's going to be the place where you can actually continue to add value on those topics that you're saying might be, you know, on their mind or, or the biggest things at that particular yeah. moment in time. And like um, in, in that, in that same vein, um, I, another thing that I've learned just as a, as a, as a manager, marketing leader, team builder, whatever, it's like, damn, does the pieces of the puzzle really matter? Um, and so what I got to do, like drift kind of like we, the, the team that we built, it just kind of like happened because the company was growing so fast. The privy thing was so different because I went to like, like at, at drift, I was there from zero and, and we built it up at privy. I, they already had like a, a, a $10 million plus business when I, when I joined. And, and so, so the, the, the difference there is like when I came in, I got to be more intentional and in thinking about the different, like, what do I need to do as the marketer, but also as a marketing leader, but also marketing leader. Okay, if if I, if this is my skill set, who is the first person I need to bring on? Who is the second person? I, and I really was more, in, and I was able to do this, luckily, but like able to be more intentional about like the skill sets of the people that we brought on. And so we had a very complimentary six or seven people, um, as opposed to like. I'm really strong in ops and the, my right hand person that I'm going to hire is also really strong in ops. That didn't right. make every, a, any sense. I'm, I'm really strong on the brand and storytelling and comms part. And so the first hire that I made was Ryan, the, the super analytical revenue, you know, like demand gen leader. And, and that, and that was amazing to have that kind of, that, that kind of fit. And, and I think it also led to like treating the team as, as peers, not necessarily as like, look, I want to hire the, I want to bring in the best people at this stage and the more you can understand the fit of the team and how we all work together um, r- really makes a difference. So like as, as a leader at any stage, you got you to know the team that you're surrounding yourself on, uh, surrounding yourself with. Where, where am I going to be biased to spending my time? And so I'm going to spend more time here. I need somebody that's super strong to be able to hold that part down. I love DG's take on building your team with each other's strengths and weaknesses in mind. We've talked about that on the show before within the context of the different roles within operations itself. But the same dynamic exists in the partnerships between ops and our go-to-market partners. DG and leaders like him are looking to us to be the experts. We can all take ownership of that expert role and bring things to the conversation that fit into those big themes that he was saying were on his mind. For example, one thing that I do each quarter in a one-on-one that I have with our CRO is ask him what are the big themes on his mind right now? Not the tactical projects we talk about all the time, not the specific goals we crafted together, but what are the big moving parts of our business that he spends his own time thinking about? That way, when I'm bringing him updates or pointing out insights, they always fall within these broader themes. Okay, back to Dave. He mentioned his journey from Drift to Privy, which as he mentioned, is an e-commerce business. When I think about my own blind spots, All of my career and most of the guests on this show have been in a pure B2B context. So I wanted to know what Dave had learned when he made that jump into the e-commerce world, both from a marketing perspective and from an ops perspective. Yeah, it's it was much more, you know, I, I had come from Drift. The Drift business has obviously become much more enterprise since the since the early early days. But even even when I was there, it was, you know. 30 to 90 day sales cycles, uh, privy was 30. So it's 30 day, 30 to 90 day sales cycles, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, $50,000 contracts, whatever it was back then. Uh, privy was free trial. Anybody can get in there, uh, app store distribution play. And so like 90% of privy traffic and trials came from the Shopify app store. So completely different marketing motion than, than, than drift. Right. 
Um, and it was 15 day free trial and the average sale price, you know, the average customer is going to come in and buy for like 30 bucks. And so it was uh, very transactional and very, you know, it was like 14, 15 day sales cycle because that's how long, that's how long the trial was. And so, um, it was different, but I think what I learned at drift is like, I think we, we really understood the kind of fundamentals and the principles. And so like, I didn't have perfect benchmarks going into privy, but I had a good enough sense of like, huh, that seems really high or that seems really low or, uh, surprise, the sales team isn't touching all the leads. And, and, and you know, it's, it's always, it, it, so it was, so it was interesting from that perspective, but it was also cool. It was like, it was a really, it was a really interest, a satisfying, like, mental thing to go and apply kind of what I thought I learned at drift to a different business, uh, and be able to like, to, to find other ways, other ways to go about it. And I think those things translate. I think it's a different industry, but it, it, it is still is B2B. We just are selling to, to small businesses, but it's like, it, it is much different. And, and a lot of it was, uh, was touchless or like one, one sales call and they close. I mean, the other thing that was obvious to me that you also took with you from from Drift and applied was just the idea of you 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 recognize that you needed that education and you just sought out role models, right? So as someone following along, you could see like, okay, great, I'm going to be incredibly open about the fact that I, this is a new thing for me, and then I'm going to use podcasts or whatever as my means of saying to people, hey, you're smart about this, teach me about it, right? And like that's something that you know it's you and me and everybody who hosts a podcast at Drift, like we've been selfishly doing that for years. This is an unbelievable like hack, and I and I talk about this, like to me the like the the super secret ROI of doing a podcast as an individual is learning, uh, and so like when I when I went to Privy, I I launched our initial podcast and and I hosted maybe the first thirty episodes, and I didn't try to pretend like I was an expert in in ecom. I pretended like I was a marketing nerd who thinks he knows a lot about marketing and loves that. And e-com is like pretty, you know, it's fun to understand. But I took the angle of, all right, Sean, so like you're an expert in e-com. I just spent the last four years as a marketing, you know, in marketing and B2B. Tell me about this. And so like I got to, you know, go to this with a blank slate and learn through podcasting. And I got to do 30 interviews with some of the smartest people in the, in the e-com industry and who's, I don't think I've ever said econ, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and that, that was an amazing way to learn. I also found like, I f the other thing was like, I found one or two channels to go really deep on. And so, uh, I think it's too hard when you're like, if you're going into a new industry, it's too hard to like try to study everything. And so what I did is I, I asked Ben, the founder, I was like, what, what's your like number one podcast in this space? And he's like, oh, this guy, Kurt Elster has this podcast, the unofficial Shopify podcast. And I made that my habit. I didn't listen to anything at audiobooks, podcasts for like, for, for probably the first two months, any workout, walk, whatever. I just binge listen to this guy's podcast and it helped me get up to speed so fast. Granted, it's not like I was going, to, it is still marketing. It's still SaaS. Like I was not going into cybersecurity where I would be drowning and never be able to figure it out. Um, but like to be able to learn, learn through them and, and learn that industry that, 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 that made, you know, gave, gave us a, a huge advantage for sure. What I really appreciate about Dave is that despite all of his success, he still tackles new challenges, new industries, new topics with the exact same approach as earlier in his career. He seeks out role models, he finds the experts, talks to them, and just acts as a sponge. Now, if you follow Dave on any social media, LinkedIn, Twitter, the other thing that you might have seen him talk about many times over the years is how he loves to do things in marketing that you can't actually measure. And as operators, this doesn't exactly fly in our world. So while I had DG on the show, I had to ask him, where does he draw the line between the stuff you should measure and what you just can't? Okay, so I think like most of that is trolling. <laughs> <laughs> the truth comes out. Like, yeah, I don't mean like, let's take a hundred grand and spend it on LinkedIn and not measure it. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> What, what I mean is like there's typically – I would say this typically relates to things like content, podcasting, social media. It, it typically relates to some of the more like 
uh, brand channels, I guess, like non-direct response channels. And like mm-hmm. what, I, what, I, what I mean by that is like there, there are just some things that like you can do because they, they feel like the right thing to be doing. And it doesn't – it's not like the whole team has to shut down what the – the things that you have to measure are – when you're when you're spending money to a to to get something back, of course you should you should measure that. That is that is obvious, right? Uh, or when the whole team, or, or if it's not like a direct response initiative like that, when the whole team is spending lots of time on on something, and so like we should be able to measure the the impact of spending a million dollars and having the whole team spend half a year working on an event. We should be able to measure something like that, of course. Does the does the output always have to be pipeline? No. There are other measures, but I think that like there's a whole camp of people in marketing who kind of will only do the direct response things. It's more of like the the inverse of that. Like we will only do the things that we can directly measure, right? And so when you do that, you miss out on things like this. Like what is the what is the ROI of doing this? Like could you add up, you know, how much your salary divided by the hourly rate that it is, you know, how many episodes you've done and try to track that, that's, that's never going to get you anywhere. Right. But like what happens on those channels that are not direct response channels is there's so often you kind of feel little pockets of things, right? Like I don't actually have a sense of the ROI of me being active on LinkedIn, but I know that it's helped me build a private community of 3,000 members. I get messages all the time from people, investors, advisors, this job, that job. Not That is like – I don't know how to measure that, but I feel it because I see it every day and I measure it by – I get a lot of inbound emails and messages. That's how I measure that, right? I don't know – early days of Drift, we didn't know how to quantify a dollar perspective, how much pipeline Seeking Wisdom our podcast was bringing – but we would walk through the freaking Copley Mall in Boston and, and people would be like, DC, and they'd see him and want to wave, <laughs> right? Or I would go and speak at an event in Amsterdam and three people uh, uh, not speaking English come up to me and tell me – and we had no presence internationally at the time – how right. how big of a fans they are of Drift and they haven't bought it yet, but they love our podcast and they're getting budget and they're going to buy. It's like it's those pockets of of things, and that is where I feel like you know don't forget the kind of like art and science of marketing. You got to be able to measure that, but there's these little pockets of you know of of engagement of of audience feedback, and I think this is what is so powerful about social media and podcasting is like you can. You know, people talk about direct to consumer from an e commerce standpoint, like, you know, Harry's razors or whatever. But, like, when I think of social media, the power of direct to consumer is like you can create a relation, you can reach your dream customers or dream audience like instantly anywhere online. You, Sean Lane, stood up a podcast about operations and have now created this like community of operations people. That doesn't need to be a hundred thousand people big for that to be really powerful, right? Like yeah. uh my friend Eric Jacobson runs this company called Lemon Pie where they do podcast production and and, and stuff like that. And and he's like we we get maybe like a couple hundred uh, downloads of our podcast uh, every month, but like the amount of le- great quality leads and business that we've got from that is like multiple million dollars in revenue, and that's plenty for our small little agency. And like so, so it it, it also is relative. But like I don't want pe- I I say this because I don't want people to miss out on some of the like authentic responses and conversations that you can get from creating community. Um, if you just only focus on the hardcore, like direct response ROI type stuff. I think, you know, the thing you said about the art and science of marketing, right? It, it's that art and science applies everywhere across the entire go to market, right? Even in the direct response world, right? You know, I have sat through endless conversations about, do we have the exact right, perfect at multi-touch attribution model to say who was getting credit for this particular thing? Like at the end of the day, like if you don't have the right amount of meetings or the right amount of pipeline, all that stuff doesn't matter, right? It might help you make better decisions, but seeing the forest of the trees a little bit, I think helps with problems like that. And so if if that analysis paralysis is stopping you from launching your new podcast, getting this DGMG group out the door, like that's the stuff that is just not going to be helpful and you'll never actually ship anything. Well, like... <laughs> Also, like when we get so caught up in the marketing and the ops side of things, like if you go all the zoom all the way back out, like 
in order to get people to buy from you, they first have to know you and like you and trust you and, and believe that you're the right fit. And so like, we like to jump right to like the tactics, like book a meeting and meetings aren't working. And so therefore this is broken. It's not that this is broken. It's like maybe enough people don't know you and like you and trust you yet. And so there's kind of all these little things that these, these little, these little touch points that, that go into that bucket the reason it, it's just hard to measure it's hard to measure it's hard to quantify the like how many it, it's hard to quantify that's what it is it's like yeah i, I mean can't, yeah you can't really we need, quantify we need to get, we need to get 100,000 people to know like and trust us in order to get yeah. 25,000 people it doesn't work like that and so i just think like you have to you have to factor in look even if even if you want if you want to look at this like more quantitatively like the the best benchmark that i that i've seen and if you're if this is a shocked that I have this book, but like if people on the ops podcast haven't read this book, data driven marketing, the 15 metrics, everyone in marketing should know this is like, th this is too, way too much for me, but like, <laughs> dude, I, I, come on, if this is, this is I'm what impressed. I, this is what I'm I very do. impressed. This is what I do. Look at, okay. So, so like this book, this is like from a hardcore analytical operational person if you spend 100% of your budget on demand gen, you're going to fail. You need to have, you need to have a split of s maybe 70% on direct response related initiatives. But guess where that other 30%, that 30% is spent in brand building to get people to know, like, and trust you. And so like the, you need the combination of both brand and demand. You, you can't just, if you have all of, if you have all of one, it, you're, you're going to be in bad shape. And like, I think I think the the seventy thirty mix is is probably right, and I just I like to have a lot of fun with that with that thirty percent. I don't know if it was you or DC who who said this story, but the the idea that like when you and I go to work, like we don't all of a sudden become B two B Dave and B two B Sean, right? And so right. that idea of like no like and trust and building that with people, like it's just with with people, right? And that has to do with the expectations of our customers, but I think the same thing applies. Like your your po your podcast is a perfect example, like. It, it, it does it, it drift is it doesn't matter to drift if your podcast generates pipeline it's, it's it's a good thing to do regardless however i would bet that if there's a marketing ops if if, if marketing ops mary shout out to you marketing ops mary is listening to your podcast and she is leaving her job and she's going to get a promotion and going to a new company and at her new company where she just got a promotion She's super excited because she gets to own the marketing ops budget for the first time and she gets to select the tools to build the marketing stack. If she listens to Sean Lane's ops podcast and Sean Lane works at Drift and she obviously knows that, wouldn't you bet that Drift is going to be on the short list of things that she's going to go try? A hundred percent. That 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 thing is just hard to measure in like a, quanti a quantifiable, predictable way. And I, I have felt this, like a lot of the marketing... Uh, that I have done has been organic brand building type stuff. And like that stuff is amazing because the, the, the metrics, the economics of that are amazing. The re response it gets, but the CFO and the other people, they don't like it because it's not as predictable. We can't say like, okay, if we spend 50 grand on AdWords, we get this. If we get 60, we spend this, if, you know, a hundred, it, it doesn't work the same way. You can't, it's not as predictable as like, well, if Sean puts out 20 more episodes next year, it just doesn't work like that. And so people don't like it, like to think about it. It's harder to quantify. Before we go at the end of each episode, we're going to ask each guest the same lightning round of questions. Ready? Here we go. Best book you've read in the last six months. Ooh. Okay. Ah, it's tough to pick one. You're putting me on the spot. Um, actually, I'll give you it. It's a book that I'm reading right now. It is called uh, One Summer by Bill Bryson, and it's about the summer of 1927, uh, which is – I love it because I've been, I've been really interested in history, and this is kind of like a, it's narrative – nonfiction, which I've learned is a genre that I could like, so I'm going to get more, where like he's telling the story of history, what happened that summer, uh, Charles Lindbergh, Babe Ruth, uh, the Mississippi flood. Like it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to learn history, but it's told through, through narrative, and, and I really like that. And I also think like given everything that's been going on in the world like the last year or two, uh, reading more history 
uh, has helped me understand that like a lot of what we're going through has happened in some in some way uh, before. Like even in this Bill Bryson book, I posted this quote, this tweet the other day. It was like in 1922 when they first launched uh, radio stations. The way that it was set up was so like anybody could really create. I don't know how they did it, but like anybody could stick up an antenna and like create their own radio station, and it was like exactly what is what podcasting is today it's so wild and so um it's cool to study that so so i i would i would go read that one that's a good one that was a good one all right normally i ask ops folks their favorite part about working in ops so i'm gonna ask you your favorite part about working with ops nothing no just kidding and that's the clip for the episode (laughs) (laughs) um I think my 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 favorite my favorite part of working with ops is like I think that is the most it's like the most essential it's the most essential ingredient like you can't you can't cook without without butter and 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 salt and like it's like you you need that now that I know that I think my favorite part about working with ops is like I come from much more of like the creative uh the creative side of things and I love having a a partner in ops who like we are kind of like, yin, you know, we are the yin to each other's yang. And like, I, I like um, how ops can be the real like business driver. Because at the end of the day, as much as I love the brand stuff, the thing that I'm trying to drive is revenue. Like the, the, the CEO only cares about two things out of marketing at the end of the day. Number one is the story and number two is pipeline. And you can argue about which order those things should go in. Uh, and I think that the, the more that marketing ops is like a real, a real strategic partner and, and, and peer to me in that role. Like that, that's, that's the best part. No doubt. Flip side, least favorite part about working with ops. I don't know. It's just like, uh, it's, it's tough. I think this is true with any team that, that is involved more in the technical side where like, uh, things just take, things just take time and, I don't always appreciate, this is not a knock on ops. It's just like, I, I'm very much like a, I have an idea. Let's do it right now. Yeah. Cause it's hot. Let's go do it. And usually there's things that just have to take time and, and, and have to be set up. And, uh, I think part of me is learning to be a little bit more, a, a little bit more patient. I'm shocked by that answer, Dave. I'm shocked. Uh, all right. Somebody who impacted you getting to the job you have today. Uh, there's, there's probably two, there's probably, th- there's, there's three people that I, I think have had the biggest impact the last probably five or six years. Uh, obviously DC at, at drift, like we kind of have this marketing wavelength that it's, it's kind of weird, but I don't, I don't know if anybody's replicated that. And we kind of are on that same wavelength together and push each other creatively that way. Uh, the other is Mike Volpe, who was my, my boss at HubSpot, but like, actually, no, he wasn't. I, I reported to Joe Chernoff at, at HubSpot, but Mike is somebody that kind of just like helped me out, uh, once I went to drift and we've gotten really close after that. And then the last is Ben, who's a CEO of, of Privy. Um, I've just been lucky as a marketing leader, I, to, to work, to have worked with two CEOs back to back who get marketing, who believe in marketing, who uh, question the right things, but but they, you know, I think I always say like life is too short to work for a CEO who doesn't get marketing, and that's because there's so much in, marketing is hard enough as it is. There's so much internal stuff that gets in the way. To have work for Ben and have work for DC who like want to invest in marketing and, and are ready to do it, like that's the dream scenario. And so I think I, 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 a lot of credit goes to goes to those guys for sure. That's awesome. Last one. One piece of advice for people who want to have your job someday. I don't know. The job that I have now is like, is, is not a good comparison. Uh, That's probably fair. I would say like, if you want to be a VP of marketing, a CMO someday, um, I think you have to, you have to become obsessed with how all of the pieces of marketing works. Um, and have a and you don't have a have to have a mastery. I think you need to have like mastery of maybe like one or two score core skill sets like product marketing, like demand gen. But I think the all of the 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 good marketing leaders that I know know enough about every single area of marketing to do it themselves a little bit and like 
the the benchmark that I use is like, could this person like kind of plug this gap for like a little bit while we find the right person, or could we know how to hire hire the right person? So I think you gotta if you're a if you're a, a marketing manager on a content team right now, but you want to be CMO one day, master your role in content, but also be be learning from how does demand gen do this, how does ops do this, how does PR do this, and so. Cause, cause you want to be able to be ready for that opportunity. And so all of a sudden you're, you're leading marketing. You got to go and hire a PR agency and you got to figure out analyst relations and you got to uh, f- hire a, hire a designer and you don't have one and you, you know, you got to do all those things. And so I think the more you can become a, think of marketing as a business unit and you need to know kind of like the five or six uh, core areas and, and, and know enough to, to be effective in each one of those places. Thanks so much to DG for joining us on this week's episode of Operations. Welcome back, DG. Thank you so much for being on the show. If you liked what you heard from DG today, make sure you are subscribed so you can get a new episode into your feed every other Friday. Also, if you feel like you learned something today, make sure to leave us a six-star review on Apple Podcasts, six-star reviews only. All right, that's going to do it for me. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.